In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Edward Crawford, co-founder and president of Kotala Holdings, a Texas-based diversified holding company, and Sonny Vanderbick, managing partner of Satori Capital, a Texas-based multi-strategy investment firm. Today, we're going to dive deep into the idea of conscious capitalism and what that means. There's a lot to unpackage here, but let's set the stage and first kind of give snatch, uh, snapshots of your firms and your background. So, uh, Sonny, would you mind kicking off and kind of giving a, just a high-level overview of what is Satori and, and, and your background? Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start with my background. It helps on, on how I got here. Um, so, a long time ago in a place far, far away, I was an Army Ranger. Um, ended up in the technology business um, after that. Started a company in my 20s. Um, took it public, sold it, bought it back a year later. Um, ran it for another four years, sold it again, learned a lot of hard lessons um, through that process. Uh, and as a result of what we saw going on in the world, Randy Eisenman, the other co-founder of Satori and I, decided we wanted to bring an investment firm into the world that um, had some different values and a different vision. Um, so we founded our investment firm on the principles of conscious capitalism. Um, today, we have two core businesses um, one is a private equity stage business, invest in operating companies that are typically five to 25 million in EBITDA, um, either a minority or majority investor, um, and another business that invests in other investment funds. Um, and so I'll pause there um, because I think our, our yeah. story really ties in deeply into conscious capitalism as we go further. Awesome. Edward, uh, what's the background on, you know, how you led up to Kotala and, and what is Kotala? For sure, for sure. So I, I started my career in the Peace Corps, which is an odd place to start your career. And that's where I started my first business. Machete wielding coffee farmers, about 300 of them, built that in Dominican Republic near the border of Haiti and lived in a little $12 a month shack. So that was my first big entrepreneurship business experience. And then went on uh, into the military, uh, worked at Goldman Sachs for a while, um, and then built, helped build a real estate private equity firm as well. And uh, really the, the tenants, the having kind of a mission-driven life and caring about that, Ralph Manning and I, um, similar to Sonny, we came together. Ralph has an incredible investing background, very successful as a private equity operator and builder, uh, came together with really the, the idea behind mission and margin and building businesses of significance that had both a mission Right, but also we're sustainable and margin in a system around that. So we developed the Katala Enterprise System um, and really started building that business um, together. Cool. So let's dive into it. Sonny, what is the story of conscious capitalism? I saw the TEDx talk and I think it'd be just really cool to dive into what that actually means and maybe what it doesn't mean as well. Yeah, uh, I'll start a little bit with what it, what it doesn't mean. Um, conscious capitalism is not kumbaya capitalism. Um, it's not a kinder, gentler, soft on the edges capitalism. The, the big idea is this, like businesses work better when instead of prioritizing the shareholder, we prioritize all the stakeholders. Like what if when we made decisions, we could think about what's the right choice for the customer, for the employee, for the supplier, for the community the company might be in and so forth. And so said another way, it, it's not the pursuit of profits, it's the pursuit of value creation. How do I get great outcomes for everybody around me? Our experience was that when you do that, the profit stuff works out. Like where are the great companies to work for that have happy customers and happy suppliers and everybody loves the company and investors aren't also very happy. Like the story over and over again is you see these things together. And so it's about understanding how they fit together um, and what the sequencing is. Like business is not an ATM. Right. There's this sort of broad narrative in the media that sort of that business is just about money. And my experience with most leaders is that it's about a lot more than money. You've got you know, vision and purpose and, and people start these businesses not to get paid, but they see the world in a different way and they can't help it. Like I get asked, like, why did you start Satori or why did you start Data Return? And the real answer is I, I just couldn't help it. I could see the world in a different way. Um, and so I'll tell you how this plays out in, inside Satori. Again, the big idea is this, let's stop thinking about just shareholders and let's think about all of these stakeholders together under the belief that actually the way to get the best outcome for shareholders is to make sure you get the best outcome for everybody else first. There are really three things about our business that kind of bring this to life. So one is just the idea itself, this sort of stakeholder focus, how Second is the idea that, that investors who have 
been down that road before, make different decisions. We think we're different in the boardroom uh, because when a CEO is struggling with an issue, we don't just sort of sit and throw rocks. We've actually been in their shoes before. You want to grow your sales force. You have this issue with the customer or so forth, particularly at this size and stage. Because most of our companies are 30, 40 million in revenue, up to three or 400 million in revenue. There's a lot of work to be done, right? This is not just driving some stuff around in Excel. You, you got to be willing to help. And then the last piece is this idea around time horizon. I can say that I want to be as conscious as I can as an investor, but if I have a forced exit in five years, I'm, I'm necessarily a short-term thinker. Like the, the duration of holding matters a lot and the structure of our industry is set up in a way that, yeah, on day one, I'm a five-year thinker, but a couple of years into it, I'm a three-year thinker. And so now all of a sudden you're not thinking about how am I going to build value for the next decade? You're thinking about who am I going to sell it to? Well, you make different decisions. And I'll give you a micro example. The right long-term choice to make in a customer relationship might have some short-term expense to it, but over time that builds value. The right choice on, I don't know, sending leaders back to school. It's expensive to send people to leadership schools or to get their MBA or what have you. It's extraordinary for their career development. There's a lot of value creation long-term in the business, but if you're gonna sell the thing in two years, you'd never do that because there's no payback. So we think one of the really important unlockers was time horizon about being able to say, look, we can be an investor for any amount of time. And it might be three years and it might be 33. We're, we're not connected to um, how long it might be. Is this because of the fund structure that you have? That's like, right. Yeah, we, we had to build it from scratch in terms of how to make that work. It took us a couple of years to figure out and was expensive. And um, kind of everybody, look, this we started this in just for context. By 2008, 2009, we're running around talking about this stuff. And people are looking at us like, we're just legit crazy. Like, what's wrong with you? Now, Look, I started an internet company in 1996. Um, I've heard that before. Like, you know, I remember telling me, you're going to buy stuff on your computer someday. I'll show you. And they're like, yeah, I don't think so, little kid. Get out of here. You know, Randy started a mobile phone business, um, mobile app store in, in the early 2000s. Same deal. You're crazy. So we got to spend a good bit of time with people saying, hey, this is a little bit nutty. But that's okay, because our experience in our own business was we did the right thing long-term for customers. You do the right thing long-term for employees and so on and so forth. The investor side like works out really well. You know, it, it, the, the first point you're making, it sounds obvious. Don't think about just making money. Talk about all stakeholders. But what does that practically mean? Because within the framework that I'm thinking about this, there has to be this, I pull from this direction, which means I have to give in this direction. Or we think in, a wrong, in the wrong paradigm of- Yeah, so, so we call that the big lie. <laughs> right? the, the big lie- <laughs> is that prosperity is a zero sum game. And go look at the last two or 300 years of human history. And what it will tell you is that capitalism generates prosperity for everybody in the aggregate. Like well, look at what's happened to the standard of living in the world in the last 300 years. For the average human being in the world, totally transformed. Medicine, food, shelter, everything. Does it mean we fixed everything? Absolutely not. But just as sort of the, like, the median human in the world their experience has been improved by capitalism more than anything else in the world. So it's not a zero sum game like that. It, generally, I find that that's if you can get through that part of the decision, if there's a fixed pie, then yeah, I'm just making trade offs. But if there's not a fixed pie, now I can create prosperity everywhere. And so let me give you a, just a simple example. It's, it's an easy, super basic one, that, but it makes the point on an operational basis. If I spend a bunch of money this year on software that appears to make earnings go down, and it does for the year, but it also lets customers get their needs met more quickly, accurately, and efficiently, and it makes my team's job easier so they can be happier and do more work in the same amount of time, what happens next year? I have happier customers, happier employees, and I make more money. There was no zero sum game in that. I increased net prosperity in the world in that move. And it, you can't always do it, right? It's not, none of this stuff is perfect. There's no gold standard. It's the pursuit of it that matters to say, when I've got a decision that appears to be give from one or to give to one and take from the other, I got to go try harder as a leader and figure out what's what's my path through this that allows me to create value for both of these stakeholders where where my net value creation actually goes up. This is not easy. This stuff's really hard, but it actually works. Is there a difference in how LPs would look at this 
and how GPs, as they are going through, you know, emerging managers who might want to spin off and do their own thing in the next year or two, what do they need to be considering? And also what do LPs, either from an institutional perspective or elsewhere, I mean, this even goes to the future of private private capital. That's right. What's, yeah, the, I think what's that, the big picture? It's like, hey, listen, you're going to make X amount less by doing this. Is, if that, is that even true? I mean, you've been doing this since 2008, so you've been through these cycles. Um, what's the big picture here that GPs and LPs need to think about from well, using the conscious capitalism lens? If you think you're going to make less, you've missed the point. You've missed the point entirely. Now, there are types and places and kinds of investments that are you are making a trade off of. I'm going to get lower returns because I'm trying to create some value in the world that um, I call those like better than gifts. Right. So when, when I talk to nonprofits, um, in fact, Satori gave an award this year um, in conjunction with United Way. Um, it's the Entrepreneurial Spirit Award. And so this was basically like a shark tank for for baby nonprofits trying to go do stuff in the world. Um, and, and our award and, and gift that went with that award was for the entrepreneurial spirit. Who's bringing a repeatable business model into what they're doing as a nonprofit? Like what if a nonprofit could sustain itself indefinitely instead of needing donations every year? I think those are the kinds of places where accepting a lower than market return are appropriate. For this kind of stuff, we actually think over the long term, you'll get a more than market return. Like we think there's more value creation opportunity than short term cost cutting and financial engineering that if you build great businesses, you are rewarded for that in extraordinary ways. Um, so don't, don't accept or expect a lower return if what you're doing is conscious capitalism. Now, again, there's other stuff that's, um, you know, I'm going to do bonds to help low income people get into cars at more fair interest. That's fine. But that's a different thing than this is um, commercial investing. So like rule number one for us is our, our competition is everybody else that invests in private companies. Like and we need to be fierce competitors in that world with those kinds of outcomes for investors. We just are gonna do it a different way. Um, Edward, what does mission and margin mean to you? Yeah, it's interesting that Sonny brings up the sustainability of the kind of long-term focus. So mission and margin, we actually developed a Tao or a yin and yang um, to see how mission and margin are held in equal regard. And if you look in, I, I trained under a guy named John Elstrott and studied, you know, Grameen Bank um, and a lot of the you know, mission oriented businesses that did well and sustainable. And if you don't make a profit, you know, to Sonny's point, if you don't raise money and you don't have a long term thesis to your nonprofit, you're not going to be there to help the people you want to help. If you have a mission in your business to deliver a product or service to people and you don't make a profit, you will not exist and you will not be able to do that. Right. And so the, the mission margin really have to hang in equal regard. And our mission is really to unlock the power of human potential to not look at the spreadsheet, but to look at the human beings, the butts in the right seats and the impact that you're having. Right. And then our margin is really our Catala enterprise system. So looking to integrate on the profit side, a lean management system for sustainable profits. Right. We look at people, plan, process, performance in that order right mentorship, we're not the heroes, the business owners are the heroes, right? We get them the right mentorship, the right backing, right? Plan, we help them build the right plan together. Process, we put in the right processes to create sustainability for the long term because some of these businesses are smaller and are more entrepreneurial in nature, right? And then we track that process and, and, and look, at, look at how it works. So really it's, um, you can, you know, have a great, you can get, you can give a lot, you can try to, you know, help or have a great product. But at the end of the day, if it's not sustainable, it's not going to have that long-term impact. And we just have made some recent decisions. Um, if you look at short-termism versus long-termism, we can hire great salespeople laterally into organizations that are rock stars, um, that are kind of mercenaries, and we can hope that they do well any given quarter or year, right? Or we can hire young people in our HVAC business right now. We've, we've hired some military veterans, some younger people. So we can invest in a training program to train those people up and build a culture that's going to take us a long time to do. It's not going to be realized this summer during the cooling season, right? It might be a year or two years. But if we build that culture and people know they can come and be trained and be happy in the place that they work and stay there and build a career as a military veteran, then we've won. 
or we can go try to find somebody short term that can really sell a lot of HVAC systems and do well. They may stay a year or two, and that's that kind of short term versus long term. And similar to to Sonny's model, we we try to you have to tie the capital to a long term focus. If you have a fund structure that is strict and says you have to sell between year three and five, then you're going to be motivated to do certain things those years as opposed to building something longer and lasting to make an impact. So that's how we think about uh, about um, mission and margin, very important to us. Uh, Ralph and I both come from a faith-based background as well. So that ties into it as well. We're only on earth for a certain period of time. We wanna make, leave the earth and the people um, in it better than we saw it. And so we see ourselves as, as guides and kind of servants to the uh, leaders that ultimately are running a lot of these businesses. What do you think that the past year has done for bringing this different dynamic of, you know, what the industry would call ESG or, you know, in the conscious capitalism framework or in the mission and margin framework, what do you think might have been different now as a result of this past year? <laughs> Hand it off to Sonny. <laughs> yeah, happy to take it. Uh, so I think one of the starting places on this, I think it's it's likely really confusing. Like, look, I've had the advantage that we're now over a decade of, of thinking about this stuff and working on it and hearing all the different flavors. And, and I think about it like a family that all has a similar mission, but they're all different. Like you get two brothers in a family and you go, wow, those are, those are very different people, but they're kind of all headed the same direction. And so ESG and conscious capitalism like are not the same thing at all. Um, and and all of, you'll see all of these other flavors of this, but they are all speaking to some unmet need that we can expect more from business and that business has a more important role to play in the world than just a thing where money happens. And so we're all going about it in different ways. And so the answer to your question, it kind of depends on how you're going about it. Um, what I do think though is, the past year has raised the conversation up mightily on is this important or not, right? Five years ago, it was kind of like, yeah, yeah, I don't know about that stuff. You know, 10 years ago, it was you're crazy. Five years ago, it was maybe a year ago, it was, hey, that's kind of interesting. Like it's, it's building some momentum. And so I, one of the things I'm appreciative of is to see all these different flavors of it come to the world. Because I can't say my flavor is any better or worse than anybody else's. It fits us and our experience and the way that we can be successful in the world. Um, and I'll give you an example that, you know, we haven't talked about much, but it's, it's somewhat relevant in this conversation, the team at B Lab and B Corp. Um, and what they set out to do was to say, hey, we've got a legal structure issue um, that in the corporation, there's some case law that says it's exceedingly difficult as a board to make a decision that preferences anything but the financial stakeholder. We got to fix that. And so they created a new type of corporation. And in many states now, they actually have some flavor of this new type of corporation that's legally allowed to care about these things. Now, in our case, because we're significant investors um, and the other investors are probably the you know, current owners of the business or the past owners, like we can also decide what the shareholders want because we're all in the room together. But I think this idea of giving people sort of legal framework to make great decisions is another important pillar. It's part of the family. And ESG is too, because in ESG, what they're saying is, look, we've got some things we maybe haven't paid attention to. And at a minimum, so I kind of think about that one as like, that's the minimum bar corporate America deal. Hey, we should probably stop dumping shit in the river. That's yep. probably a good idea. Good idea. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so forth. And so it's like, those are great ideas. I can't tell if the ESG behaviors are, hey, they're just the right thing to do. So like, go fix that. Or if there's value creation opportunity in there, I don't know. I do think it, it, it removes risk. Um, we went and, and talked to a company a while back who historically, they were talking about this treatment system they had in, in the basement. They were manufacturing operation and they do plating. Um, and, and plating tends to have a bunch of ugly chemicals in it. And there's just, at the moment, there's no way around it. It's how it is, but it means you need to be really careful. And they're like, yeah, we used to dump all this stuff in the river, you know, but we put it through our treatment system, you know, down in the basement. And, but now we can actually put it in the city, city drain. And I'm like, huh? would you drink that water? He's like, well, I'm not going to drink it, but you could. <laughs> and so I look at that and I'm like, you know, I don't think that's a good choice. And you tell me, so if, you, if we were an investor in that business and you said, yeah, but it's going to cost us another 50 K a year to not put it in the water system or not put it in the river. I don't need to talk a lot more about that. Let's go spend that money. Like, I don't even care if it's not against the law, 
there's some things we can just look at and go, that's just a bad idea. W one of the ideas we have in conscious capitalism, that's an easy way to like get it. Like, hey, what is this dude talking about? Imagine for a minute, you're the owner of the largest company in a small town and your name's on the door of the company and you can never sell the business. How are you gonna make decisions? When you see your suppliers in the morning at Dairy Queen, for those of you that have been in rural areas, right? That's, it's hopping at the Dairy Queen at 6 a.m. And your customers, you're going to church with them. And your neighbors are also your teammates and employees. And so you live in an ecosystem where everything's near and you can see it. And oh, by the way, the river out back at the manufacturing plant, your cousin's ranch is downstream of you. Now, how are you gonna make decisions? When you decide what you're gonna do in this supplier issue, how are you gonna make that decision? Knowing that you're gonna see them on Sunday and your customers are your neighbors and so forth. And so that quick way to get at it, largest employer in a small town, your name's on the door, now what are you gonna do? I think that is a good sort of guiding way to look at how to make these decisions. For people who are interested, where can they learn more? And what are the big questions that they should be asking themselves? And what are the big misconceptions that they need to think through? I'll start with the last one first. The, the first big misconception, the big lie, um, is that prosperity is a zero-sum game. If you got to get through that before you get through anything else. Um, but once you can hold that idea for a minute that, you know, if I spent some money on making the culture better, the team would be happier and more productive, and maybe our economics would be better, right? As soon as you start to think about it that way, it's not a zero-sum game. The second piece you got to get your head around is time horizon, right? If you're only thinking about this month or this quarter or this year, you're going to tend to make decisions that preference the financial lens too much. You've got to be able to think longer term. Now that can go too far. If you only think in 10 year increments, you may run out of oxygen. So, you know, this, this idea of balance is mission and margin is important. You do need to think about them both. Um, and then the last piece is just, if you're going to make an important decision, stop and walk through each of your stakeholders and say, how will this decision affect that stakeholder? And if the answer is a negative effect on that stakeholder, just ask yourself, do I have a better way? Is there a better idea here where I could create positive outcomes for all these stakeholders? And you won't always get it right. You'll miss stuff. You'll forget people. You won't be able to solve the problem. And that doesn't matter. What actually matters is it's a little bit better every day. Now, I think this, this idea of leave it better than you found it is a really important one, right? No perfection, only progress. And if every day we're a little bit better than we were the day before, we're a little more conscious, we're a little bit better place to work, our customers like us a little bit better, like we're actually making the world better by doing capitalism. How cool is that? So it sounds like one of the, I mean, one of my big takeaways from this is just changing the framework or the lens through which you operate in a day-to-day -day basis, you know, step one, you know, lens one is a principle based considering all stakeholders, not just um, focusing on the financial aspect of it, which is okay. part of, you know, like, gotta make your LPs happy, gotta make the, you know, the investors in, in the institutions, but it's, it's, it's changing the mindset to not be zero sum focused and taking everyone into consideration. Edward, what, what do you think is in you building up Kotala with the team, kind of what is your big message to everyone on how to think about mission and what has been working with you and the portfolio companies? Yeah, I think what, what works for us is there's, when you when you create a culture where people love what they do and they wake up and they're excited about it because there's a there's a mission component to it. You know, I remember in the Peace Corps, you wake up every day and you're like, I'm gonna try to change the world. Now, you get your face kicked in, you lose 50 pounds, it's hard, you try to start a business, you've always got those tough things each day. But when you're trying to build a culture with a real mission, you're making a difference. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. We In home health, we have a segment of home health called hospice right? And hospice nurses are like God's angels here on earth. And we look at what we do. I've been there, do. done that two times, my yeah. dad and my brother. Yeah. And so when we look at what business we're going to invest in and the impact we make, uh, and we look at supporting those nurses in a time like COVID where they're at home or somebody's stuck at home, you have an elderly person. My grandmother recently had COVID, uh, got it on Thanksgiving. She's 99, will be 100 if she makes it. 
right, uh, in February. And, um, you know, you look at who takes care of her, right? And then you look at the hospice nurse, God forbid she ends up in that situation. And that nurse is the best friend of our moms and dads um, as they go into the final stages of their life and slip into the next life, right? And that person that's there with them, guiding them through that, it's, it's, it's super important that, that we do that business, right? And, and not that it be done, but that it be done right. That seven days after that person has left the earth, that there's not a bed sitting in that person's house and the family has to come and figure out how to get rid of it, right? And so doing those small things well, and so that's where the margin, the system comes through. If, you're, if you've got a you know, two out of five ranking in your hospice business, and you're not really delivering a high quality of service, what are you doing? So the more competitive, the more continuous improvement you have on that business, as you get closer and closer to a five out of five, the better you are serving that person, that, that mission. And so that, you know, we really think about it when we look at a business, our HVAC business is similar. We want to treat people with dignity, respect in their home and an experience that can be intimidating. You can have someone in your home saying, you're gonna to need to spend $14,000 to buy a new system. And they can be aggressive about that. We choose not to do that. We will fix the system, we'll set you up with a gold star family plan, for example. Gold star families, everyone on this call knows what that is. We try to treat our families by being long-term and saying, hey, we'd like to set you up with a service agreement and, and have you as a customer for 20 years, not sell you a system you don't need. We also make donations to Gold Star families as part of that, right? And so we try to think of how, how do we, you know, how do we treat our customers and then how do we hire kind of Gold Star quality techs to go into homes, right? We think about it through all those different lenses. And that's one of the things I love about conscious capitalism is looking at all those different stakeholder models and truly, truly trying to find that alignment. And for me, um, going into private equity was, you know, the private equity side of business was not something I was interested in. I would have loved to be a Peace Corps volunteer, be in the military my whole life, or, or you know, um, serving the government, make an impact. But I saw, to Sonny's point, I learned from John L. Strott and a lot of these others that you can have a massive impact on human lives in business, and actually more than you can uh, in public office, more than you can in many other in many other areas of life. Um, but that balance has to once again be there, and the margin part, you, you've got to be competitive. You've got to be continually improving. You've got to have A players because it's very competitive out there. And if you get soft um, and some of the ESG things, I think are great initiatives, but some of them aren't really great sustainable ways to do business. If you get soft and you lose, then all your employees lose, all your customers lose their best supplier, their best um, person they work with. So that's a, that's a little bit of kind of how we think about it. You know, to, to even apply this to what we're doing at the, you know, four person digital marketing firm is just like one of my key takeaways is also just having a service mentality or a servants mentality. You know, is how can I serve people first? And I, I think that sometimes gets lost, especially in the chaos of running a business and like, like you got to do this $25,000 project, $50,000. I just got to find a way to get this across the finish line. And sometimes I forget even about the team and it's like, wait, go back to being a servant. Like, how can I, am I servicing my team? as a leader and taking care of them um, as a, an equal stakeholder to your, to your point, like they are an equal stakeholder in this, like I'm not running a private equity firm, but how can I apply that mentality? And so that's one of my big takeaways. Um, and I think another big takeaway is it doesn't have to be a nonprofit donation or use of your calendar to still have an impact. Impact can be in business. And yes, it's okay that you people define the impact part of their life is doing a lot of good stuff in business. If it has that principle-based framework, and that is truly in the front of mind. And so that's really one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently. You know, I spent a lot of time, you know, volunteering with veteran related organiz organizations and that, but it doesn't have to be necessarily that as 100% of my impact goal. Like, yeah, I can still help people out through business, but I just need to change my mentality. Guys, we could do like, a part two of this, a part 10. There's so many ways. I know I'm going to have a million questions. Um, let's, I love to kind of think on this more. And I just wanted to have this as like an, almost like an intro, <laughs> like a part one to this subject. Cause I think we could dive deep in a lot of areas, but I really appreciate you taking time to, to talk about this. 
and uh, to bring it more to the forefront of, you know, what people in our industry are thinking about. Always happy to do it. Thanks. For Thanks, Jordan. Us. Really appreciate it. Great to see Thanks you all. You guys. guys. <laughs> all right. See you later. All right. Have a great day.